great. Welcome to today's live expert tips with the Neri Sim Center. Today's session is interact interactive seismic performance assessment of buildings in a Jupiter environment using Pelican with Dr. Adam Jarnotsai. Uh, Adam is a research engineer at Stanford University where his work focuses on disaster simulations that support multi-hazard risk assessment and management at a regional scale. At the Simmer Center, Dr. Janotskaya is the Associate Director for Research Outreach and the lead developer of the Pelican software. His research interests include probabilistic natural hazard assessment, model development and calibration for structural response estimation and performance assessment, and uncertainty quantification in large-scale regional simulations. Adam, thank you for being here. Thank you, Matt. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to see some friends in the audience, and I'm also happy to see some people I don't know, because that means our group is expanding. And uh, I hope that some of you have already used Pelican before, uh, and some of you will start using it after today's live expert tips. Uh, this is a, going to be a, a different kind of presentation than what we used to do at the live expert tips, because we are staying entirely in Jupiter. Uh, this is a new thing for Pelican 2. I think Pelican used to be used through the PBE tool that we have or uh, through uh, input files and, and running it as, a, as, a, as an application using the DL calculation Python script. If, if you have used Pelican, you're probably remembering this or this sounds familiar. With the new version of Pelican, that's Pelican 3, uh, I put special emphasis in making such interactive calculations available, like the ones that I'm, I'm going to show today, because I heard feedback from researchers that this is something they are interested in. So I hope you find this useful. If you do, please let us know uh, after the presentation, or, or you can just send me an email afterwards, because if you are interested in learning more about this, I'm very happy to uh, do similar live expert tips where we do uh, go into the details of the calculation. As you will see, even though I will spend about 30 to 40 minutes today to explain this, we will stay at a superficial or at a high level when it comes to the, the details of the FEMA P58 assessment. And what I'm going to focus on today is just to show you what you can do in a Jupyter notebook with Pelican. Uh, there are many options, and we are only going to pick one for each step rather than going into the details of what is possible for demand, damage, and, and loss uh, analysis and simulation in Pelican. Everything in this notebook, or the entire notebook itself, is available on DesignSafe right now. And I will start by showing you how you can reach it, because maybe not everyone is uh, familiar with uh, DesignSafe. And this is a really quick thing. You can see the project number here or if you just remember that this is a Sim Center event that will help you find uh, this uh, notebook. So if you go to Design Save, this is my second tab here. There is a project there that is called Neary Sim Center Pelican Examples. This is a project that I will keep updating and add more examples uh, that use Pelican 3, not only in a Jupyter environment, but most of them will be probably like that. And the first one, I just published it this morning is the live expert tips that we are having today. So if you go to Design Save, go to the published projects list. Let me just show you how that works. So I will do it in a private window because that, that way I'm not even logged into Design Save. I go there, Data Depot, and then here I search for Sim Center as a keyword. And this is the first thing that comes up near Sim Center Pelican examples. You click on it. And then you have the notebook right here, just like I showed you. Okay, you can download it. You can run it on your own computer through a Jupyter environment. You can run it in Jupyter Lab, or you can run it on Design Safe by clicking on this Jupyter link here. You will need a Design Safe account for that, but uh, as far as I understand, that is free, so you can register and start using it. Okay, so if you are interested, I encourage you to check it out. Uh, I have a bunch of uh, notes and comments in the, in the uh, script below. I am not going to have time to go into every detail, as I mentioned. So if you look at it after the presentation, you will be able to learn more. 
or you can use this as a template for your own FEMA P58 style analysis and bring in your own data and own files and run something like that using this notebook. So I hope you will find it useful. All right, so I will start with some context. You, you see the, the table of contents here. I will start with some, some context and an introduction to Pelican, just a few minutes, and then we will go straight into these calculations. We will talk about how to uh, first simulate uh, and sample some demands, then calculate the damage, and then some loss assessment. All of this uh, in the next about 35 minutes. So just for some context to put uh, Pelican and uh, what we are talking about today, uh, uh, you know, put it in place within the Sim Center uh, project and the Sim Center tools, I want to mention that this is just one of the tools that we develop. It's used in many other uh, places in the Sim Center, but you might be interested in other tools that the Sim Center works with. So if you have not done that yet, I encourage you to go and visit our website take a look at our research tools, learning tools. We have test beds. We have a knowledge hub with webinars available. So I think it's worth taking a look if you are interested in natural hazards engineering. Now, when it comes to Pelican 3, it's important to mention that Pelican 3 is in a beta stage right now. I call it beta not because it's not working properly, but it has not been tested thoroughly. It takes time to test. It takes users to test these things, and I don't want to make it a stable version until I feel that it's really vetted and mature. The mature version of Pelican is 2.6 still that has been released for some time now. If you are using this for something mission, mission critical uh, or if you are using this for your PhD and you will graduate soon, stick with Pelican 2.6. That's what I would recommend. But if you are a new PhD student, you have three more years or four more years ahead of you, I recommend you to start using Pelican 3. It's going out of beta in a few months and then uh, you will be able to enjoy all the extra features and, and uh, capabilities that are there. Pelican has a documentation that still works uh, and discusses about uh, Pelican 2.6 uh, because that's the stable version. As soon as Pelican 3 becomes stable, we will switch to the new version. Until then, there is this notebook that you can use as a template and you can reach me at any time or you can use our message board to reach us uh, and I am very happy to help. Everything is online. It's open source. Pelican 3 is online. You go to the Neary Sim Center GitHub uh, repo and you can download the source code. So there is no secret. It's just that I want to differentiate between a development uh, part of the code and something that is uh, more uh, robust. OK, so a few words about Pelican in case you have never used it before. Uh, uh, just, just to have an idea of how it sits within the Sim Center ecosystem. So what we are doing at the Sim Center is we are developing an application framework for performance-based engineering or more like regional risk assessment. And this framework does a couple of things, not just loss assessment. But within this framework, when it comes to damage and loss assessment, we almost always use Pelican. So we have these puzzle pieces that are inspired by, by this original uh, uh, figure that was developed by Keith Porter, I believe, around 10, 20 years ago. And this step, the performance assessment step, is where Pelican comes into the picture. Uh, it's one of the modules that we use that connects to all the other modules that we use for hazard response and recovery simulation. Now, within this step, Pelican tries to integrate uh, multiple different methods, not just FEMA P58, and create a unifying performance assessment framework where you are not stuck to a particular method but you can choose the kind of method and tailor it to the way uh, your research or your work desires. As you will see uh, in the next uh, uh, scripts uh, that I present, I am even changing the terminology slightly from FEMA P58. So Pelican was inspired by FEMA P58, but in order to integrate multiple methods, I generalized it uh, beyond that so that we can work with earthquakes, wind, water hazards, and we can work with different type of assets, not just buildings. And we can do simulations that use engineering demand parameters and the kind of complex assessment that uh, you are used to with FEMA P58. But it can also do the hazards kind of assessment where you go from some kind of an intensity measure like peak ground acceleration or, or uh, spectral acceleration straight to some loss measure. So it can do all of these things. And because of that, it uses a slightly different language 
than FEMA P58. But I believe that's an advantage. I believe that that opens up your possibilities. And you can say that you want to do something like FEMA P58, but a little bit different. You can do that with Pelican. You don't need to do any coding. You can almost surely just change some of the inputs, and then it will take care of the job. And this is what we will see today. Hopefully, you will agree with me by the end of the presentation. So we start by setting up the environment for uh, these analysis. Now, you don't need to install anything if you have Python already available, or you don't need to install a separate application, at least. It's not cumbersome. Staying within this Jupyter notebook, you can just pip install a couple of Python packages, and these two are actually for plotting. So if you use matplotlib, for example, you don't need these, these two packages. And Pelican, this way, by, by forcing it to install a particular version, you can get this beta version. If you don't have this uh, specific version here, you will get the 2.6, the stable release. So make sure you add this 3.1 B2. And then this is only required because we are running this on DesignSafe. You can see on the URL that this is in DesignSafe's Jupyter Hub environment. So I'm not running it locally. And I need to point to the, to the proper site packages folder so that it picks up the right place for Pelican. And I'm not going to you know, stop at every single line of code. It's more about the context. So at the beginning, we, we import a couple of packages that are useful, NumPy, Pandas, you've probably heard about these, and some plotting packages, and some things from Pelican. From Pelican, this is the most important thing to uh, import. Assessment, that's a class. We create an assessment when we do some kind of a calculation, and we will interact with that assessment throughout the calculation. We will ask certain things, and we will get certain responses. Now. The calculation starts with the demands. So we are not going to do structural analysis. That's not within the scope of Pelican. Pelican expects some kind of a demand to start uh, working. That demand could be an intensity measure, or it could be an engineering demand parameter. So I call intensity measures demands too, because those are the demands we have to describe some kind of a vulnerability or some kind of losses in a structure. In this particular example, because we are running a FEMA P58 uh, study, we have engineering demand parameters as the demands. Our study looks at a, a four-story steel moment frame. This is an example from FEMA P58. This is the only example in FEMA P58. It's in the second volume. Uh, and it's described fairly uh, uh, in detail. Not everything is uh, provided, but uh, we can make some assumptions and, and get a good case study for it. It's a, it's a building based in LA, and uh, they provide uh, some EDP information, and we are going to use that EDP information as inputs for the calculations. So if you are interested in more details about the building and the example, you can go to the background document for FEMA P58. This particular document, if you search for it, it's very easy to find. It's freely available at uh, ATC's website. So you can go to this document and uh, take a look, uh, it, it provides much more information of how they developed this example. All right, so what I did is I took that document and then collected the EDP uh, distribution information from it. We have uh, peak floor accelerations and peak interstory drifts defined. Both types of EDPs have a median value and a log standard deviation provided, so they are assumed to be uh, following a multivariate uh, log normal uh, distribution. I will explain what these uh, uh, labels mean in the next part. So SimCenter uses, let's stick it with like this, uh, uses uh, this type of labeling system with four pieces to describe, to identify EDPs in a structure. The first uh, piece corresponds to the stripe or the event uh, in our analysis. Now we are running a multi-stripe analysis, so there are eight stripes, so we, we go from one to eight. Then the second thing identifies the kind of EDP that we are looking at. Here's a list, if you are interested, of all the EDPs that are currently supported in Pelican. You can see that there's PGA, PGV, peak floor velocity, uh, uh, peak roof diff ratio, uh, story diff ratio, and so on. So PID is peak interstory drift, PFA is peak floor acceleration. Then the next two numbers identify the location and the direction of the EDP. So for example, this one is peak floor acceleration on the first floor in the second direction. 
I think it's pretty straightforward. So this way we always know where that particular demand is in the building. Now, once I load this data, and this is in a, the demand data CSV, it's also provided to you in that uh, published uh, data set on DesignSafe. It looks like this. If, you, if I open it, it's just a table like this. So I load it. And then the next step is to convert it into a format that uh, Pelican can understand. Pelican doesn't work with median and log STD because that would limit it to log normal distributions. So we move from that format to something like this. It's not a big change. You have the same index where you keep the type of the EDP location direction, but you need to provide the type of unit that is used when you define these values, the family for the distribution, and then theta zero and theta one are the two parameters of the distribution. So for a log normal distribution, we are looking at the median and we are looking at the logarithmic standard deviation, but we support other kinds of distributions too. And then we can, here there's some code that I was, I hid that creates a plot and you can take a look at the kinds of uh, EDPs that we feed into this analysis. So we feed in drifts and floor accelerations. These are the, num the different stories and you can see the median value and then the range of values that uh, are described by these distributions. So this is fed into Pelican. It's as simple as creating an assessment. You can provide some options for the assessment when you create it. Those of you who have used Pelican 2.6 before, you, you are used to creating an input file. You no longer have to do that. You can, but you don't have to do that uh, in this uh, new version. So all you need to do is create an assessment and start working and issuing com commands uh, for it. So we have PAL here, that's our assessment. And we will say that we want to load a demand model like this. And this is our demand model. That's the table that I've shown earlier here. So this is the table that we created with the medians and standard deviations. We feed that to Pelican and it's responding by sending us some messages telling us that the model was successfully loaded. I'm not going to run every cell. I pre-ran everything so that we are not wasting time uh, running things. Uh, everything runs pretty quickly. The entire notebook runs in about two minutes. So once we loaded these, this information, this tells Pelican what kind of demand distribution we have. The next step is to sample that distribution. So we will have uh, a predefined number of uh, realizations of those demands. So again, we go to our assessment and we say we want to generate a demand sample and provide a sample size. And then what we see that we successfully generated 10,000 realizations of demands. And this is where we start to work uh, interactively with Pelican because what we will do now is we take these demands, again, interstory drifts and floor accelerations, and we will extend them because we also need residual drifts and we need to know the spectral accelerations for the damage assessment, as you will see. So what we do is we ask Pelican to provide us the sample that, they, that it just generated, the 10,000 realizations. And it gives us this demand sample and you can see it looks like this. You have a header where you see the type of EDP, the location and the direction. And then I show the first five uh, rows, but there are 10,000 rows. And you can see that there are drifts and accelerations and these are individual values. So we have that coming back from Pelican. And then the next step is to get residual drifts. There is a method uh, recommended by FEMA P58 to do this, where you calculate or estimate residual drifts based on peak interstory drifts. We are going to use that, that's built into Pelican. So all you need to do is take the demand sample for the interstory drifts and feed it into Pelican with a yield drift value provided. I'm using a yield drift value based on the publication in FEMA P58 and get the residual drifts back from Pelican. Then I combine the demand sample from Pelican and the residual drifts that were provided so that now I have residual drifts also in my sample. This is in this Jupyter notebook. And then I also add another uh, type of demand, which is SA at 1.13 seconds. 1.13 seconds is the uh, first node period of the structure. This is going to be required to assess the collapse probability using a collapse
it, it starts with PFA, the dot, dot, dot part includes the drifts, and then we have residual drifts and the SA. This sample can be fed back into Pelican. So the sample in Pelican can be updated with these changes before we continue the calculation. And I think that's, that's the cool part of it because this way you can edit the demands, you can make some changes according to your research or your uh, you know, uh, kind of problem and then continue with the damage assessment. So this way you can really customize what you are doing. You are not forced to use the exact same procedure that FEMA P58 prescribes. So here we, I'm just plotting uh, two of the demands, the peak interstory drifts and the residual drifts. This is to show you that their uh, correlation would be very difficult to describe ahead of time. So if I wanted to include the residual drifts at the beginning and ask Pelican to just sample it as a multivariate normal distribution, I would not be able to get this relationship. This is not a Gaussian uh, copula that we see here. So we needed to have the peak interstory drifts from Pelican and then do the assessment of the residual drifts outside to get this distribution available, all right? So that's the extra thing that we can do by, by working through this uh, Jupyter notebook. Oh, and I didn't mention, but of course, the Jupyter notebook is just a Python script. So if you, if you prefer to work in, say, MATLAB, but want to keep this kind of interactive uh, uh, behavior, you can create a Python script and call that from MATLAB or call that from, from another software. So we prepare now this demand sample that we will feed back into Pelican. If you use these uh, comments, you will, you will see what we are doing exactly. Nothing really special. And, and at this point, we load the sample back. You see, this is our assessment. We are talking about something related to demands and we load the sample back into Pelican using this command. And we can see that uh, it's successfully parsed. So at this point, the demands are ready. We have 10,000 demand samples and we can move on with the damage calculation. Now for the damage calculation, I said, I have some comments here. I'm gonna say most of these things as we move along, I just have it written there so that you will be able to, to review it after if you are interested. Uh, component quantities need to be defined to, to do a FEMA P58 calculation. This particular building has 37 different components and each of them are assigned to different floors and different directions in the building. And this table that I call the component marginals provide information about where each component is in the building. The way this works is very similar to how it used to work in Pelican 2.6, but just in case you don't know how that worked, I, I give you a quick overview. So the first column is the index that identifies the component itself. These, these numbers refer to FEMA P58 components. These extra three are different components that we will add to the uh, list. Uh, we will talk about that a little bit later. Each component has a unit. The unit identifies what unit the quantity is described in. The location and direction columns identify where the components are uh, assigned to. So for example, this first one is assigned to the third and fourth floors in both directions. Theta zero is the amount, uh, the quantity that we assign to those locations and directions. We could add more columns and we could have a, a probabilistic assignment where we have a distribution of the quantity instead of a specific deterministic value. But in this case, these quantities have a deterministic value. So they are exactly 2.0 in all 10,000 realizations. The blocks are the component blocks that we use within a performance group. You can imagine if these are some kind of connections, this means that there are two connections assigned to the floor and they are two blocks. That means they are two independent units and they get damaged and uh, they work completely independently of each other. So there could be one damaged or the other damaged. If you had only one block, you would have two units, but either both of them get damaged or none of them get damaged. That's what these blocks do. In most cases for structural components, you, you divide them to individual blocks. But when it comes to say a partition wall, you assign a certain square footage of partition wall and you decide how big is a block that you consider to be damageable independently. That's not going to be one square foot. It's going to be a little bit bigger than that. So it's up to you how you define that. If I go to the 
file that I just loaded, it, it looks the same. This is the same uh, structure, it, it's just in a CSV. And you can see that there are some uh, units that have these larger numbers in square foot. These are the partition walls that I just mentioned, the C1011. And if I move here, you can see that the number of blocks is not exactly the same number as the square footage, but smaller. This is how we get to those uh, pieces of walls that get damaged independently. All right, I'm going back to the notebook. OK, so we load this file and then uh, assign it to the asset model in Pelican. So we, we used to work with the demand model that's sampling the demands. The asset model is taking care of the components in our building, or it could be a bridge or any other kind of asset. It's really flexible. Here, because it's a building, we assign a number of stories. This is useful for taking care of these cases where we have location assigned to all. If we know how many stories there are, it will automatically pick up uh, that number. This way, you can use the same component definition for different buildings if you know that you will assign certain components to all of the stories. OK, so we load this. Again, we get some response from Pelican so that we can see that it actually loaded them properly. And you can see that internally, it does store these uh, distribution parameters also. They are set to NAND because we have a deterministic definition. But you could provide these things uh, if you wanted to have a probabilistic component definition. Now, moving on, we can take a look at individual component uh, values just by, by asking Pelican uh, about the marginal parameters for a particular component. And you can see that we get the same things that we fed into it deterministic 2.0 or 1.0 at specific floors and in specific directions. So we can generate a sample of these components. This is going to be a very simple thing because they are deterministic. So it just generates 10,000 of the same values. But if it was probabilistic, this is the point where you can sample these distributions. And then we need to, yeah, we can take a look at this. You can see that they are exactly the same values. These are the components in specific locations and directions. And this is the quantity that we will use for the uh, future calculations. The next step is to uh, identify the fragility data. Fragility data describes, uh, basically, those are the fragility functions that describes how certain demands lead to certain kinds of damages in the building. Here, the important part to, to recognize is that uh, Pelican does not just use damage states, but also uses limit states. Fragility functions identify limit state exceedance. And then within each limit state, you can have one or more damage states. This is similar to what's in FEMA P58, but FEMA P58 calls both of them damage states, which I found uh, confusing. So that's why I differentiated uh, the naming. So first, we have fragility functions to get limit state uh, exceedances. The FEMA P58 fragility functions are bundled with Pelican, and you can load that data uh, in a Jupyter notebook like this. You just say get default data, and you ask for this type of uh, fragilities. We are also working on a web-based fragility library where you can review not only these fragilities, but all of those that are included in Pelican. Uh, so this way, you can quickly see what kind of fragility functions are there. And uh, you can also review if there are data pieces that are not complete. Unfortunately, FEMA P58 comes with a lot of incomplete fragility definitions. In this case, we are looking at 193 are incomplete out of the 764. So that's about like 25%. So usually when you do an analysis with FEMA P58, you have some work to do before you can actually run the simulations because you need to complete those missing uh, details in the fragility functions. In this case, uh, you can see in this cell, I select the ones that are incomplete. And uh, you can see that, where is the incomplete here? Incomplete column tells you if, if a particular definition is incomplete. So one, yes, zero is no. And we have these uh, definitions that were not complete before. These are mostly non-structural components. You can see here the details, some piping, a chiller, a cooling tower, air handling unit. They were missing the capacity descriptions. So we don't know how much acceleration will lead to the triggering of that limit state. 
And I just came up with random numbers, almost random numbers, based on some some of my own judgment. But uh, you know, you would need to do a much uh, more thorough look at these components and their capacities if you were doing an assessment. And this is not available in FEMA P58, so usually you have to look elsewhere. Okay, so we extended those definitions, filled in the gaps, and then there's three more components that we want to add to handle irreparable damage and collapses. The, the way I, I integrate different methods is by creating a, a, a framework in Pelican where you don't have to have special cases identified for collapse, for irreparable damage, or for any other global uh, kind of uh, limit state. But those are also handled as, as yet another component that is considered the global component. And I explained that here. And what we do is we create these extra components here for excessive residual interstory drift, where we use the values that are provided in FEMA P58. So we say 1% uh, median and uh, 0.3 log standard deviation is the capacity of the structure. So if we have more than 1% residual drifts, usually we are in trouble. And we do that, we assign this component to every floor. So Pelican will pick up if we have more residual drifts on a particular floor, it will trigger a limit state exceedance for those floors. And then we will say that if any of these components is experiencing a limit state exceedance, we trigger irreparable damage. That's, that's still within the same kind of framework like other components work in FEMA P58. Similarly, for collapse, we say that it's another uh, component that is driven by the peak spectral acceleration. And we bring in the collapse fragility curve, which is defined like this in, in that particular document for this example. And using that curve and the peak spectral accelerations that we defined before, we can evaluate if the building collapses or not. So that's just another uh, fragility function from that point. And what we will need is to link these things to the other components, and I am getting there uh, next. So first we have these extra components defined, and we load this into Pelican as a damage model like that. We just take this table that we have and send it in, that's it. And then we get to the damage process where we link the different kinds of damages together. So we have collapse, for example. When the building collapses, we don't want to have damage in the other components because it's either collapsing or it's damaged. So a damage process is used to do these kinds of logic, logical connections between damage states and uh, define them for a pelican. Here we say, if the building collapses and it's in damage state one, collapse only has one damage state, then all of the other components should not be evaluated. And if the building, anywhere in the building, we have an excessive residual interstory drift, then we should trigger irreparable damage. And you could expand this. There's a lot of versatility and, and potential in these damage processes. If you want to do cascading damages, imagine other types of hazards like hurricanes, in that setting, it's very trivial that, for example, the roof damage would lead to other kinds of damages inside the building, but you don't have to go that far. If you think about uh, damage to the piping in the ceiling leads to damage to the floor, right now that's handled in, in FEMA P58 in a rather cumbersome way, but with these uh, damage processes, you can just say that piping gets damaged that leads to floor damage, and you don't have to uh, do the simultaneous evaluation of, of fragility functions that, that don't know about each other. You can link them together with this. So it's a simple dictionary, as you can see, and we feed it into the calculation when we ask Pelican to do it. So we say calculate damages and we feed in the damage process and that damage process will be taken into consideration when the calculations are run. Now, in the end, if the calculations are completed, we can ask for the sample of the damages. So we get for each component type, you see the component types here, for each location, for each direction, every damage state, including zero. So you understand how much of the components got no damage and different damage states. 
And these quantities are already converted into the unit that you were using uh, at the beginning when you fed the component definitions to Pelican. When you see NAND, that means that the building probably collapsed because we had that in the damage process. So if I go to the very end, um, yes, you see that we have collapse cases right here for these two, for example. So you see that all of the other damages were removed exactly as we wanted. You can also look at individual components and look at some statistics of the damages. You could plot these damages. So there's a lot of things you can do with them. And if you wanted to, you could modify them and feed them back into Pelican before the loss assessment, like we did with the demand. Now, the last step uh, is to look at losses. And we are only going to look at repair consequences in the interest of time. Here, what you need to uh, see that is different from the typical FEMA P58 calculation is that Pelican decouples uh, fragility uh, information from consequence information. So you can link up different fragility functions with different consequence functions. And again, this gives you a lot more flexibility. Oftentimes, FEMA P58 uses the same consequence function for multiple components. So it's more efficient to recognize that and link the same function to the different kinds of fragility functions. This happens, for example, with structural components where the beam sizes are different, but the repair action will be similar for them. Then you have similar consequence functions for, for different beam components. All right, so first we need to create that linkage, that mapping between uh, the different kinds of damaging uh, uh, models to the loss models. Now in FEMA P58, we are using the same IDs for the fragility functions and the loss functions. So it's a very trivial linking for most of the components. But you can see here, this is the interesting part where we can say collapse and irreparable damage both lead to the same kind of consequence, which is replacement of the building. And we can load the consequence data. Again, that's included in, in uh, Pelican. So you can take a look at that data here. Again, you can look for incomplete uh, consequence uh, definitions. Fortunately for this example, all of those were uh, complete, so we don't need to do extra work. And then we can define the replacement consequence. And the advantage here is that that consequence can also be probabilistic. In most FEMA P58 calculations, the replacement cost is a specific number, but that's not realistic. So with this approach, you could have a probabilistic replacement cost and uh, trigger that when the building collapses or whether when the building becomes uh, irreparable, irreparable. You can see this is all we need to define a, a new replacement uh, cost uh, consequence. This is, in this case, it's deterministic because I wanted to stick to what was in the example. But if we had a family here and a theta one value, we would have some kind of a distribution and we could sample that properly. We load this model into Pelican together with the loss mapping that links the damages to the losses, and then simply ask it to do the calculation of building repairs. And after it's done, we can ask for the loss sample. Again, we have a lot of information here. DV is the decision variable. At one point, somewhere down the line to the right, we see cost and time. And you can see the loss function and the damage function that was used. If I go to the very end, then it will make more sense. So the, the losses are the replacement consequence model coming from either collapse or irreparable damage. So you can trace where the losses came from, on which floor, which direction, and uh, which damage state. OK, so damage state, location, that's the floor, and direction. This is a huge table with a lot of information that you only need if you do more work with this data uh, at that level of granularity. Oftentimes, you are more interested in the aggregate losses. So you can ask Pelican, OK, I, I, I'm happy we have this sample, but let's look at the aggregate losses, the total repair cost and the repair time. You just ask for, for it with this function. It will return to you such a table where you have repair cost, repair time, in the two options that are uh, available in uh, FEMA P58, either sequential repairs, where you assume that each floor is repaired after the previous one, or parallel repairs, where every floor is repaired, repaired in, in parallel. 
And you can see these are the times that we get. If I assume the typical uh, 0.001 worker per square foot that is suggested in FEMA P58, I get about 20 workers for this building. So these repair times are in worker days. If I divide them by 20, I get the days that it would take to repair the building. And I'm just showing you two plots here. This is the repair cost distribution. So it's a million dollars. And then this is the repair time distribution between the uh, parallel and sequential repairs. So you can see that there's, again, looking, we are looking at something that is not a multivariate normal. So it's a good idea to preserve this data if you do further calculation, like a functional recovery uh, assessment, for example, with these data. Okay, that was that was like a quick review of everything that's in uh, this notebook. There's a concise version in the end where I uh, condensed all the commands that are needed to run this assessment without you know, showing the tables or showing those extra figures. There is a lot of pre-processing to be done because you have to prepare the tables that uh, are fed into Pelican uh, with the demands, with the, with the consequence functions and the fragility models. But after that, this is the demand calculation. This is the damage calculation. And then this is the loss calculation. So it's only a few commands uh, to run these assessments. And of course, you can put this in a for loop. You can, you can, you can do many things, of course, as you, as you would expect uh, in such an environment. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we still have some time for questions, so I hope you have questions and I'm looking forward to them. Thank you, Adam, for uh, walking us through Pelican with this example. Um, there's a lot of information in there. Your tables are uh, giant. It's incredible <laughs> the amount of information to sift through. Um, a couple of questions. Um, the first is uh, regarding residual drifts. So you had some residual drifts that you showed in the beginning. Um, were those uh, out of a FEMA P58 methodology for estimating residual drifts, or did those come from uh, a simulation of, uh, of a structure? They came from FEMA P58. Well, they, they were inferred using the methodology in FEMA P58. That's, I believe, in Appendix C of Volume 1, where you use the peak interstory drifts and the yield drift as the information to get an idea about the uh, residual drifts. This is an approximate method, but according to FEMA P58, it's often more reliable than a numerical analysis unless you have a really good structural model. And so those would be the two um, maybe accepted methods for estimating the residual drifts? I would say it's widely used. I wouldn't say it's accepted. People don't like residual drifts, I think, so there's no accepted method. But yes, yes, it's, it's, I think residual drifts are very important. If you look at this example, uh, you will see that a substantial amount of the losses at this, uh, this is the 475 year return period level. So we are looking at the third strike. And already at this level, a substantial amount of losses come from irreparable damage. So depending on how your residual drifts look like, your losses will swing greatly. So I think this is an area that could uh, benefit from more research. And, and uh, yeah, we, we clearly have a gap here. OK. Um, another question is uh, regarding other software uh, for estimating damages and losses. What would be the primary difference between Pelican and SP3? There's a couple of differences. Let's see. Uh, from a, from a technical point of view, SP3 is limited to FEMA P58, but they do that really well. Uh, they invested a lot of energy and effort into making sure that you don't have this kind of a problem, where you are looking at 193 incomplete fragility definitions. So they spent a lot of engineers' work hours on figuring out those missing data, and they provide that for you. They also automatically populate your buildings with components, which is incredibly helpful. And uh, they create nice reports. So they make the whole whole experience much more enjoyable, I would say. But you have to pay for it. So that's, a, that's another difference between the two. Another difference is that since it's 
only FEMA P58, you are doing the kind of calculation that is laid down in, in P58, but if you want to deviate from that, you cannot really do that. Here, I reproduce P58 because that was the topic of today's live expert tips, but next time I might come in with a hazardous assessment or something that is a hybrid. So you can really experiment, and I believe that's what researchers would like to do. So I think FIM, uh, SP3 is more uh, aiming for the industry and for, for the commercial market, and we are trying to serve researchers. Uh, we are in good relationship, that's my understanding, with the HB Risk Group, and uh, we are trying, actually not trying, we are working on connection between the two software so that SP3's outputs could be used in Pelican and uh, vice versa. That's also something that we are developing. Um, is it possible to integrate the normative quantity tool uh, that's provided through uh, the FEMA P58 uh, with Pelican to make it more practical for regional resilience assessments? It, it is certainly possible uh, if there is if there is uh, someone who you know writes it up. It's it's not that complicated, but one thing that uh, uh, the person who asked the question should keep in mind is that this will not be enough for regional assessments because the normative quantity tool does not give you does not give you structural component quantities. So there is a little bit more work to do. But if someone creates those auto population scripts, I think that would be highly valued in the community. Uh, but that's a lot of work, especially for the structural parts. Yeah, but once it's there, it's very easy to integrate it in Peloton. Okay. Um, for those outside of the United States, um, what do you think uh, would be needed to integrate these values? I'm assuming they mean the fragilities uh, for their uh, consideration in, in where they are uh, in their country. So. I think this is this is again an area where Pelican is very useful, and uh, and the, those databases that we provide uh, and uh, the web-based uh, viewer of these fragilities and consequence functions could be very helpful, because as the as the person who asked this question probably knows, all of these are defined for the Bay Area in California. Now, if people start to populate those databases and share different kinds of uh, fragility and consequence functions or, or methods to convert between the uh, one and the other, I think we as a community can quickly arrive at a repository where we have many different options for, for different parts of the world. But bringing FEMA P58 to everywhere, I think is very uh, uh, resource intensive because, because there's so many components and so many things to think about. But again, let me remind you that Pelican is not limited to FEMA P58. So first you can bring in the hazard style assessments that are already available in many parts of Europe and uh, I believe also Southeast Asia. So you just look at your local hazards implementation that might not be called hazards, but it's very similar and basically bring in the, the vulnerability functions or the fragility functions from that and they will work in Pelican without a problem. It's just a table that you need to define. Fantastic. Thank you, Adam, um, for both the presentation and these uh, answers to the questions. Uh, for those attendees here, thank you for your questions. Um, I want to remind those who are uh, viewing this uh, uh, later uh, that you can join the Live Expert Tips uh, by finding upcoming events on our webpage, which is simcenter.designsafe-ci.org. Once you're on our website, you can find uh, the list of upcoming events. You can also subscribe to our Sim Center newsletter, so you're the first to know about uh, other events, uh, recent updates to our software, and other community news. Uh, this concludes today's live expert tips. Adam, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, we hope that you've been inspired uh, to pick up uh, Pelican and adapt its capabilities to uh, your research. Thank you very much, Adam. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it.